So, yeah, so welcome everyone and thank you for coming. It's a real pleasure to have you all here for this is the last of our um, Synapse seminars for the year, um, uh, transdisciplinary seminars, and I'll just um, send a message with the link, the web page for the Synapse seminar series. And once we do have new seminars lined up for next year, starting from February, they'll be there and we'll also obviously send out announcements um, about those. And yeah, so welcome to today's talk and then I'll just pass over to Nick Evans who is going to introduce our speaker. Hi everyone. Yeah. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, John Richards, Richards and his talk. So I'll firstly just say a tiny bit about the talk uh, and how we got to this point. And then I'll say some words about John himself. So Synapse, of course, as the name of a seminar series is really there to capture this idea of different neurons connecting and firing together. And this is the, the beauty of the brain that uh, synaptic connections grow. And we like this series to, to grow things through time. So there's three particular neurons, if you like, that came together in uh, this series. So one is that a lot of people who, who come along uh, to the sign series are interested in the very general questions of how we can reconstruct cultural change, cultural difference, uh, its relation to materiality in a broadest sense, which is typically construed as meaning technology, double outrigger canoes or stone tools or whatever they may, food processing techniques, whatever they may be. But there's a second aspect to materiality, which we've all become very aware of this year. That is, we all live in a biological world where epidemics break out from time to time and completely reshape what is happening. And that's tended to be downplayed. So for example, we know as, as linguists, you know how to reconstruct words for canoes or boomerangs or, or whatever, but reconstructing terms or knowledge of disease is, is something we do much less of. So that's something that makes the day very special. And the third thing, which I think it illustrates the sort of the virtue of unpredictability and unpredictable connections is that a few months back now, uh, John contacted Bruno Olsen, who works on, on marine language and just made us aware of a fascinating book, which he's been working on and we'll hear about in his talk uh, about a particular disease, which most people, I think it's safe to say, haven't heard about donovanosis but which has been said in the anthropological literature to, to have enormous consequences for the sort of history of, of southern new guinea and the expansionist uh, nature of marine society and a number of other things and we'll hear I'll, I'll leave it to john to to talk about all of that but that's just to situate it so those that led to us thinking oh we'd love to hear more about this and, and this seemed like a good seminar series to place it in. So that's how today's event has come, uh, come about. So just now to, to introduce John, he's a, a retired doctor born in, uh, in Cambridge in the UK and back there now. Uh, and he studied classics and medicine, at King's College Cambridge and King's College London, and worked as a general physician in Garoka in New Guinea from 1984 to 1990, and became interested in tropical sexually transmitted infection there, in particular, this disease of donovanosis, which was um, sufficiently prevalent there in those uh, hospitals to have its own, own ward. So uh, from there, later on, he went back to the UK and worked and taught as an academic specialist in HIV and sexually transmitted diseases, uh, worked as a consultant to the WHO, uh, but now has been putting together his long-standing interest in donovanosis with um, the particular case that we will hear about today and has prepared a book, uh, which we also uh, will be interested to see come out uh, when it does. 
So I don't want to steal your precious time, John. It's you we want to hear from. So over to you and a big thanks to you for uh, coming to talk to us today. Great. Thank you very much. I'll just get my screen share going, hopefully. Right. Is that uh, clear to everybody? That's great, John. Thanks. Okay. I just need to get my own notes up. So I'd like to thank everyone um, uh, at the College of Asia and the Pacific for this opportunity to present a, a very unusual piece of medical history. In 1984, I arrived in Papua New Guinea to take up a position as a doctor in the highland town of Goroka, and I spent uh, six and a half years there in total. When I arrived, I followed the advice of my mentor in tropical medicine to look into a rare, little studied tropical sexually transmitted infection known as tonopinosis. I was told I was sure to encounter it, and indeed, when I arrived, I found my medical ward had a special rooms set aside for patients with tuberculosis, leprosy, and bronchinosis. I want to begin by introducing you to this little known disease, um, which I discovered later had caused a highly unusual epidemic in the 1920s among the Marins um, in what was then Dutch New Guinea. Uh, the epidemic um, was the severest ever recorded for this infection anywhere in the world by a very considerable margin. On this slide, you can see a cluster of bacteria which have the appearance of closed safety pins within a cell. And this unique appearance has been the mainstay of diagnosis for decades since they were first described in 1905. And the bacteria is uh, currently called Klebs yellow granulomatis. Um, around 1905, in a Madras hospital where this portrait still hangs, uh, Irish doctor Charles Donovan took material from a group of patients with a newly described genital ulcer disease, at that time called ulcerating granuloma of the pudenda, and in each case he found these organisms which are now called Donovan bodies. Um, I'm going to pivot myself just one medical illustration, a drawing, just to give you a sense of this nasty disease and to give you an idea of what confronted the missionaries among the Marians who first attempted to help them. Um, I recommend you avert your eyes for a moment if you're squeamish about disease genitalia. So this drawing shows typical features of the disease. Uh, which generally starts with an ulcer on the genitalia and then it spreads to local lymph glands where it's liable to erupt through the skin above the glands and without treatment it can linger on for weeks or even years although some patients do develop a strong enough immune response to bring it under control. For women who get infected with donovanosis and get pregnant at the same time it carries special risks. For instance, if the cervix is to, were to tear during labour, this would allow the infection to enter the bloodstream and disseminate widely, often with a fatal outcome, uh, and something I witnessed myself when I was working in Papua New Guinea. Sexual transmission is pretty obvious from the location of the first lesion. Um, but it is not, it's not thought to be especially infectious. Um, it would appear that it needs special circumstances if it is to spread quickly. Uh, the Dutch called this disease granuloma venereum. Um, the Americans called it granuloma inguinale, and the Brits and the Aussies still honor Donovan with the name Donovanosis. In the Marin, to the Marin, it was called tick maralkia, um, and uh, the Marin themselves thought the Dutch were to blame. Um, although they also were worried that their failure to, to repulse the Dutch um, caused offence to their spirit ancestors, the Dema, and this was a punishment for failing to, to maintain the integrity of their, of their land. The disease is, is uh, known in several tropical countries, uh, but it's now the rarest um, of all the classical sexually transmitted infections. And it was recently eradicated from um, a, a reservoir in Australian Aboriginal populations. New Guinea is probably the place where it's now best known in the world. Uh, but it was 
at one time very common in the southern states of the United States. So this slide captures the trajectory of the epidemic among the Marins um, between uh, 1920 and 1950. Uh, the Marin population was estimated to be about 14 to 16,000 at the time of first contact um, and fell quite sharply after the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic. But to see over 2,000 cases in a single year in such a small population was absolutely exceptional. And at its peak, there were villages found with more than 50% of married men infected, and even more had scars of recently healed infection. You'll see there's a bit of a flare up in the 1930s, which may be partly um, due to drug resistance at a time when antibiotics were still not available and some of these cases might have been relapses of those treated earlier. Uh, so just a, a map to remind you where the Marins live. Um, the population is mostly on the coast. At the time of the epidemic, there were about 45 villages along 200 kilometers of coast, uh, roughly five kilometers apart. Um, and there were smaller populations living up the, um, up the big rivers. And um, if I can just uh, use the pointer for a moment. Um, so a key thing is the, the proximity of the national boundary here um, had a big influence on the events that unfolded. I've marked, oops, sorry, I want to go back to the previous slide. Um, excuse me. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there for a second. Um, so I, I want to, um, sorry. Um, I want to first discuss whether this disease was uh, an imported one or whether it was introduced. And at the time, uh, most people felt it had been imported at the time that Meraki was built. And they pointed the finger at um, Thursday Island. There was some Aboriginal uh, labor brought over from uh, Thursday Island to help build Meraki. Other people pointed at uh, Chinese traders, um, bird of paradise hunters, um, convicts who were um, brought in to build most of the buildings in Meraki and so on. So there are all sorts of theories. But um, Dr. Tierfelder, who's shown in this slide, who led the treatment campaign, this is him photographed actually while he was still in Africa. That's a mandrill sitting on his shoulder. And uh, Dr. Tierfelder um, was firmly of the opinion that this was not an imported disease, that it was an endemic disease that had, had taken off in, in, a, in a dramatic style. And, Tierfelder had an interesting anecdote, um, which to him convinced him that the disease had been around for a long time. And this was an um, anecdote concerned an old man that he met who was missing his penis. Now, loss of the penis is a complication of this disease, not a common one, but it's the only sexually transmitted disease uh, where the ulceration can be severe enough to result in the, in the penis falling off. And this old man had with him a grown-up son who had two children who had reached the age of uh, puberty. So this man told Tierfelder that he got infected at the time he married and he lost his penis very shortly afterwards. So this encounter was in the 1920s and from that Tierfelder could calculate that this man must have been infected prior to 1900, certainly before Meraki was built. And uh, um, I think that if there was one man missing his penis who got infected prior to 1900, you know, he would have been one of many. This is a complication you won't see in more than one in a hundred people. So I think quite strong evidence that, that this was an endemic disease. And if one accepts that uh, this was around before pacification, then one has to look for 
factors that could have triggered an explosive spread of the disease resulting from the pacification process. And that is essentially uh, what I've been uh, trying to do. So the first factor I want to look at is what brought the Marin to international attention, and that was their extensive headhunting. Um, the expeditions that they mounted involved huge numbers and huge distances, so much so one could describe their lifestyle as semi-nomadic. And this map shows the, the various uh, routes they chose uh, to the east, the west and the north. And of course, the one that mattered most was the eastern raiding deep into British New Guinea, uh, almost as far as the Fly River industry, uh, estuary. In 1896, William McGregor um, had his first major confrontation with him on the Wasikusa, deep inside British territory. And on that occasion, I think the Marion leader was shot, 48 canoes were confiscated, and uh, uh, over 1,500 artefacts were collected by McGregor and sent to the Queensland Museum. Um, interestingly, McGregor was very explicit that this collection should be kept intact, should be regarded as the property of New Guinea and should be restored to the country when it could be housed there. And there was an early attempt to set up a museum as early as 1914, which didn't last very long. A proper museum didn't follow until 1954. And... Uh, part of the collection made by McGregor on this uh, occasion finally made its way back, I think, in the, in the 1980s. This next picture shows you the type of bamboo beheading knife uh, used by the Marins. And you could produce a fresh cutting edge by peeling off a strip of bamboo. The notches that you can see indicate how many blades have been fashioned from this particular knife and it was possible to create a surgically sharp blade um, thanks to the very high silica content of bamboo. The Marin headhunting was, was rich in ritualistic elements. Uh, the anthropologists and missionaries who asked why they took heads um, were always told it was in order to acquire names to give their own children. Um, but it's, it became clear to observers at an early stage that headhunting was also allowing infertile women, of whom there were great many, to abduct children. Robert McKinley has pointed out how much care was taken to preserve the face after taking a head. The skin was removed from the skull and smoked before replacing it and decorating it. And great respect was shown to the acquired heads. Effectively, the enemy head once dead was turned into a, into a friend and absorbed into the Marin community together with its name. And it's quite clear the heads were treated as a vital source of renewal, both for the community and the cosmos. The suppression of headhunting must have been highly disorientating for a culture that was convinced that it was central to cosmic renewal. So, the British complained to the Dutch, and after a very protracted diplomatic tussle, the Dutch finally agreed to establish a garrison at Muralki and suppress cross-border headhunting. And this uh, photo shows Muralki in the early days of the settlement. It was built mainly by convict labour. Uh, the residents were advised not to venture beyond the stockade, except to a small market where they could buy fresh food. And uh, you'll see on the right, there's a, a lamppost that deeply impressed an early English visitor. Another feature of our early Moroccan was the trouser tree. The Dutch resident um, ordered 150 pairs of shorts, which were hung on the tree, and any marriage with business in, in the settlement had to put on a pair of shorts um, to save the resident's wife from embarrassment of these um, semi-naked men. And then when they left, they had to put the, the trousers back on the tree. Before long, there was a great influx of traders and missionaries, explorers and anthropologists. And right from the outset, those that ventured into Marin villages, that was mainly the missionaries and the explorers, started to ask why there were so few children about. And the data shown on this slide was collected in the early 1950s by a very detailed demographic study. And it shows that there were very high levels of 
childless women um, apparent in women born prior to 1900. And this trend only started to reverse significantly for women born from about 1910 onwards. Uh, these are women whose reproductive life would begin in the late 20s after the rain epidemic had been tackled. So this picture was part of a much larger picture of depopulation across the Pacific observed from the 19th century onwards. And there were two main hypotheses. The medics were pretty convinced that, that infectious diseases had been introduced to the Pacific and were largely responsible. But on the other hand, we have WH Rivers um, uh, hy rival hypothesis that the depopulation was in some way linked to a form of cultural shell shock. Uh, Rivers, of course, was famous for his studies of shell shock in World War I, um, and he extended his ideas to the Pacific. It was a very speculative uh, notion, and there wasn't a lot of evidence to support it. And of course, more recently, it's been pretty much discarded entirely, but it had a lot of influence at the time. Um, but Rivers did do very important genealogical, genealogical studies in, in the Torres Straits, um, where he demonstrated that the depopulation was linked mainly to low fertility and not to excess mortality, um, despite the fact that there were individual events like the terrible Fiji measles epidemic, which caused um, impressive level of uh, mortality. Um, but the medical theory gained a, a lot more um, strengths when uh, Roy Scragg did his work in New Ireland in the, um, in the early 70s. And he was the first person really to show that um, uh, a part of the Pacific where the infertility could clearly be shown to be tubal infertility, i.e. caused by infections of the fallopian tubes. And he also provided strong evidence that gonorrhea was probably the most important infection. Um, his hypothesis was built on the fact that mass treatment with penicillin was experimented with in the early 50s in New Ireland, and the islands that received it sh sh saw a, a, a surge in, in fertility in women who received penicillin. Uh, gonorrhea didn't, is now not sensitive to penicillin, but in the 50s it was. And uh, so Roy Scragg was firmly of the opinion that, that depopulation in the Pacific was mainly caused by gonorrhea. Um, and uh, obviously chlamydia could be playing a part as well. Um, but no one knew about chlamydia um, until the 1970s as a, as a cause of infertility. Um, so I now want to focus on um, the the view of the anthropologists of the um, what I'm going to call the semen rituals of the uh, of the Marind. This photo shows us the first anthropologist to study the Marind. That was Paul Viertz. Uh, here you see him actually dressed up as a Gogodala tribesman. Viertz was really into participant observation. Um, even more than Malinowski, who was making his groundbreaking observations in the Trobriid Islands at very much the same time. Wiertz was a, a loner, kept his distance from academia. He hated missionaries, although he was completely dependent on them to learn the language. And he was a great um, critic of imperialism. He would never have accepted a role as a government anthropologist like Williams in, in Australia and Papua. Um, he, he loved collecting artifacts, but in contrast to Sir William McGregor, he traded his collections, he was sponsored by museums to acquire them, and he wouldn't have dreamt of saying his collection should ultimately return to New Guinea. He was very much the salvage anthropologist, convinced he was saving material from tribes that wouldn't exist for much longer, um, and so his collections were intended for the edification of the, the world's dominant culture. But Wiertz did make far-reaching and remarkably thorough study of Marin culture, and he is the source of the most detailed data on the uh, semen practices of the Marin, which I think were critical in the unfolding of the uh, Dolivinosis epidemic. 
he was alerted to some of these practices by the missionaries who in their private correspondence had been expressing disgust and horror at uh, some of the things they'd witnessed and learnt about. The other key figure, of course, is Jan van Baal, who you see in this composite photograph. Um, at the back, you have him as a young administrator in Milwaukee. Uh, then you have him as uh, governor of New Guinea, uh, Dutch New Guinea in the 1950s. And then finally, as the professor of anthropology at uh, Amsterdam and Utrecht. And as a teenager, Van Baal had been fired up by the famous Dutch novel, Max Havelaar, which uh, exposed the worst excesses of Dutch imperialism. And uh, so this book uh, inspired uh, Van Baal to take indigenous welfare very seriously. His great uh, magnum opus was uh, the book called Demma, um, and was heavily based on Wietz's um, earlier work. It runs to a thousand pages and essentially he reanalyzed everything that had ever been written about Marit. Uh, Wietz is cited over a thousand times and uh, Van Baal never had a chance to do much field work himself, but he collaborated closely with uh, Jen Veskuren, who lived among the Marin for the best part of 30 years and had a unique knowledge and interest of their language and customs. And the two of them realized that Wiertz did have something of a taste for this sensational. And uh, so they refuted some of his more extravagant uh, claims, uh, particularly those concerning human sacrifice. Van Baal's memoirs give a, a fascinating uh, picture of a somewhat conflicted individual who acknowledged the destructive effects of imperialism, but he also reviewed the Marind as hopelessly obsessed with their semen rituals. He was a Protestant from North Holland and didn't see entirely eye to eye with the Catholic missionaries uh, who were uh, established among the Marind. Um, so Van Baal essentially believed in assimilation and the adoption of Christianity as the only, only uh, solution to the problems the Marind faced. Um, as a governor of New Guinea later on, he was to preside over the um, annexation uh, by Indonesia, uh, but he did um, do a lot to try and prepare West Papua for independence. Um, and he correctly predicted that Indonesia, if allowed in, would exploit the country and would do little to advance the development of Papuans. So I'm now going to focus on the so-called uh, semen practices of Marin culture. These are some of the things that Van Baal listed. And you'll notice that most of them are quite independent of human reproduction and in some cases conspicuously unerotic. Um, the use of the term semen practice, I think, is uh, I prefer it to talking about sexual behavior because um, I think it is desirable to try and put some distance between the older orientalizing narratives that portrayed the Marind as, as primitive and violent and hypersexual. And I know that at least one Marind scholar, Julianus Gebze, has insisted that what the missionaries alleged about semen rituals were completely fabricated. But when you look at this epidemic, it's very hard to be convinced of this. Um, and there are to me, three additional lines of evidence that support the, the anthropological narrative that starts with the early missionaries and Pal Fiets. If we take the last thing on this list, the boy insemination, um, we have additional evidence, firstly from the doctors. The youngest age group affected by the epidemic were adolescent males who mainly had anal lesions. And this was observed from 1916 onwards by a succession of different doctors. And then secondly, we have the evidence from uh, nearby cultures in New Guinea. So um, these were described in, in uh, Gilbert Hurt's groundbreaking book, Ritualized Homosexuality in Melanesia. Uh, if we take the example of the Sambia, um, their rituals and beliefs were very similar to the Marins, except that uh, the semen feeding was done through oral sex rather than anal sex. And then thirdly, we have the evidence from Marin folklore and the, 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 um, the folk tales that 
uh, Paul Vietz collected are full of references to uh, both um, uh, boy insemination and to uh, the other the rituals involving women, which I'll, I'll come on to in a moment. Uh, and even in the modern era, I've, I've noticed that uh, some of the research done into HIV risk factors among the Maryland um, have recorded um, women quite relatively recently talking about um, semen mixed with coconut as being one of the most powerful uh, traditional medicines available to the Maryland. Here we have a, a, a very fine photograph of a men's hut um, in Marin language, the Ottiv. And um, Marin society was strictly segregated between the sexes. Uh, boys would be raised initially by their mothers. Um, they would then move to sleep in the men's house with their fathers from the time they had their first ear piercing about the age of seven. And then at puberty, a boy uh, would then move to the, the men's house of one of his mother's male relations and would be mentored by this man in the traditional male roles, as well as undergoing ritual semen feeding for a two or three year period. The Otiv also gives its name to the semen ritual that caused most consternation among the missionaries, uh, a ritual known as Otiv Bombari. And this term refers to ritual heterosexual intercourse of uh, a female with a series of male partners and this was very much the preferred method for harvesting semen for a whole range of different purposes it was much preferred to do it this way than to collect it for instance by masturbation otif bombari was most often talked about in relation to weddings uh, but it was said to be an invariable accompaniment of any major gathering. Um, special shelters would be set up around the main in, uh, ceremonial enclosure, uh, and these were for designated women to provide sexual services to male participants who would spend most of the time drumming, dancing and singing by torchlight, and then making periodic visits to the women outside. Again, strict rules about um, sex taking place between uh, men and women of different moieties of um, Marian culture. So if these rituals did follow the patterns described by the anthropologists, clearly the, they would have posed very significant infection risk. Um, the men and the women would have been heavily exposed by virtue of having multiple partners, um, the ritual of Otif Bombari would allow a very high bacterial load to be reached in the pool secretions. There would be trauma to mucous membranes, which form the first barrier to the spread of infection, particularly in the women. And then additional risks would arise from the tradition of making medicines from these pool secretions. And also additional risk would arise from the rituals that were conducted to avert epidemics when they arose, which again relied on Otif Bombari. So, I, just to summarise my own hypothesis about this epidemic, I think that the, the first key event was the import of tubal infertility due to gonorrhea, which was clearly prevalent in many parts of the Pacific at the time. And the fall in fertility initially could be offset by an intensification of headhunting. And there's considerable evidence that headhunting seemed to be getting more extensive and ranging further afield. Um, I think that the problem of infertility was almost certainly being addressed by a greater resort to Otto Bombari. And that this would then start to shift the R number for dolivinosis upwards, which would then give the Marin a new concern of um, more dolivinosis than they'd been used to. And of course, this would be addressed with further increases in the lot of Bombari. And then when the Spanish influenza outbreak took place in 1918, the Marin were very badly affected. And I think this would have shifted the R number for donovanosis up even higher and 
um, would be enough to, to trigger, trigger a spectacular epidemic as was seen. And the main supporting evidence for this hypothesis comes from the 1950s research project, um, which uh, was a year of field work, visited every village of the Marind, and the participants in the team describe a sort of almost desperate and disorderly state of Marin society in the early 1920s. Uh, the report indicates that younger females were started to be targeted and it was becoming increasingly difficult to respect normal clan rules um, during the rituals. I think an interesting comparison can be made with HIV, which uh, you probably know is thought to have crossed the species barrier from chimpanzees in the 1920s in sub-Saharan Africa. It then circulated for decades in a very limited way before erupting worldwide in the 1970s. And in, this, in the case of HIV, again, specific amplification factors were discovered, uh, particularly the uh, extensive use of poorly sterilized needles for uh, tropical disease and venereal disease campaigns, and then the dramatic transformation of prostitution uh, that followed the um, civil war in, in Zaire. So I'm now going to move on to the response to the epidemic. And the key figure here is this Flemish missionary, Petrus Patentum, who was um, a skillful campaigner, uh, gifted artist. And he emerged from this story as the subject of two biographies in Dutch. Uh, there are two statues to him, for him, one in Belgium and one in Okaba in the, among the Marind both of which describe him as the savior of the Marid. And he's still well remembered by the Marid, as I discovered in a recent documentary. Uh, the Troppen Museum in Amsterdam has a mock-up of his study in Okaba, and uh, this uh, has a couple of his best oil paintings. Here's one of them. So when my book went out for peer review, it was suggested that I should use this picture to emphasize the Orientalism on display. Um, in Patenton's favor, it has to be said that he respected this, his sitter sufficiently to add his name to this picture, which was not a common gesture at that time. But I would agree that uh, um, there is a clearly an intention here to portray this man as, as fierce, um, looking at and capable of cruelty. Particularly, I think uh, the sideways glance um, shows that. The next picture actually shows the missionary's desired direction of travel. This uh, photograph was taken in the same year that Vitenton painted the portrait of the warrior. And the man here on the left is Antonius Vange. He was abducted as a boy at around the age of eight and he'd witnessed the murder of his near relations during a headhunt and was deeply traumatized. Um, his adopting parents were made to hand him over to the missionaries who then educated him. And he's seen here with his wife, Anna, who was the daughter of a married woman and a Chinese trader who'd been employed as a government interpreter. Anna was rescued at about the same age as Antonius after her birth mother died. Her Chinese father married another married woman and the missionaries had to remove her to safety when um, the stepmother threw boiling water over her head. The picture here shows a model village built uh, by the missionaries at the village of Kumbi and it was an early experiment in social engineering. The concept came from Jesuit missionaries in the Congo who developed what were known as capital hoover or chapel farms. A plot of land was purchased from a local village to create a farm run by an African catechist who would open a school and invite parents to send their children to the school and work the farm with the aim of eventually making it a self-sufficient enterprise. Children completing school would be encouraged to marry other Christians and then settle there with their families in hamlets built around the farm until a new Christian settlement was established. 
So this model was adapted by the uh, Sacred Heart missionaries among the Marins um, to settle uninfected young couples. Um, and the, the deal was that any couple that was prepared to reject traditional Marin culture, attend Christian worship and take on Western clothing would be uh, considered for admission. And it didn't take long for the missionaries to realize that the young couples remain fertile um, compared to those that remained in the old villages. And before long, the government started to see this as a means to, to accelerate the foundation of schools and to get the Marin to assimilate more rapidly. So the epidemic actually uh, was to become a, a pretext for dismantling traditional Marin uh, uh, village patterns. Um, and the government pushed the programme actually a good deal faster than the missionaries had originally intended. This uh, photograph that uh, uh, I used, I think, to advertise the talk um, for Synapse uh, is panel from the Batenton Monument in Oak Harbour. So it depicts a sick married patient in the foreground. Um, Batenton can be spotted uh, top left with his hat and beard. Uh, Batenton left very moving accounts of his encounters with the sick and the dying and the dead. When the Spanish flu struck in 1918, he describes visiting a semi-deserted village where vultures and dogs were picking away at the unburied dead. Many of the villagers fled up rivers inland, taking the epidemic with them. The first doctor to try and help the missionaries tackle the epidemic was an Ambonese doctor, Jacob Sitamala, who pleaded uh, in vain for resources to do something. Um, he also took a patient to Ambon for a trial of treatment that failed, uh, but it was Sitanala who was the first to suspect this disease was donovanosis. He's an interesting man who had strong nationalist leanings, found himself accused of communist sympathies, um, campaigned against a land grab um, that uh, carried out by a Dutch coconut business and uh, was a sort of forerunner of more recent um, land grab among the Marind. And Sitanala ended up as the head of leprosy services for Indonesia, was awarded a medal by the King of Sweden. But Sitanala was not listened to properly by the authorities. Uh, Petrus Patenton fared much better. He wrote superb, hard-hitting articles that were published in, um, in Batavia and back home in the Netherlands. And these articles triggered a debate in the Dutch Parliament. Um, his, his article was full of statistics. He also suggested the model village programme looked like a, a potential partial solution to the problem. Um, the outcome of all this was he was invited to Batavia, um, where he did a lecture tour. And then he had a conference with um, the Governor General Limburg Stirum. Fortunately, Limburg Stirum uh, was, took the Dutch ethical policy quite seriously um, because he was replaced um, a month after he met Batenton by, by much, the much more conservative uh, Dirk Fock, who clamped down heavily on, on nationalism. And uh, Batenton was able to get uh, a very generous grant to, um, uh, to tackle the epidemic. I now want to just break off briefly and talk about other things that were going on during the 1920s. Um, two silent films were made on location among the Marin in this period. And uh, this photograph shows the elaborate displays that accompanied the release of a film called Shipwrecked Among Cannibals, um, which was the first Universal Pictures film to gross over a million dollars. Uh, the film um, has now been lost, but the story played into a favourite Darwinian narrative of the Pacific as a realm of the exotic, of hidden worlds lost in time warps and losing uh, populations, losing the battle for survival, all themes that uh, surface later in King Kong. Uh, now, of particular interest is the book that went with the film, 
which was given the title The Isle of Vanishing Men. And in this book, there's an early chapter that describes in very convincing detail a visit to a hospital in Meralki um, and a conversation with a nurse who explains that all the patients have a neural disease and that the married are on a rapid downward tra trajectory which will need, leave none left in 40 years' time. The book also has a chapter describing the consumption by cannibals of a Swiss scientist that clearly refers to Paul Veers. And then the second film was the one made by Frank Hurley. Uh, this is uh, a still from um, Jun Jungle Woman. And this was, uh, the location filming for this was, uh, uh, took place at Turai, uh, way up the Marrow River, uh, which was actually one of the places where a temporary hospital for treating dolomonosis uh, was set up. Hurley had been refused permission to film um, by Hubert Murray, um, with whom he had a major bust up. Um, missionaries had complained um, to Murray that uh, Hurley had been using coercive methods to collect artifacts and um, uh, Murray impounded the collection. Um, Murray also forbade the filming of white women in close proximity to Papuans. Hurley's film that was then made in Dutch New Guinea. Uh, it, the Jungle Woman was a blacked up Australian actress, Grace Savieri, in a beaded bra. And uh, in the film, uh, the Jungle Woman dies as she saves the hero from being bitten by a snake, allowing him to return to his white fiance. Um, so I think I'll move on now to the, the way the epidemic was dealt with. And while this film was being made in Turai, and this picture here is a, what's known as a pocular emetica. And this particular one belonged to Captain Cook, who sailed through the Torres Strait in 1770. If you pour, white wine into this cup which is made of pure antimony and leave it overnight you get a solution of antimony potassium tartrate a drug known as tartar emetic this drug had been known from roman times the emperor claudius is said to have used it after banquets to induce vomiting and uh, there's even a, a pharmacological sleuth who's written a very convincing case that mozart's death resulted from him over medicating himself with it the drug was tested on Donovanosis patients in Brazil in 1913 and shown to be highly effective. The drawing that I showed you of the patient at the beginning of my talk was actually taken from the report of this um, very important drug trial in Brazil. So when the money came through for um, a campaign to deal with the Donovanosis among the Marins, the first major expenditure was, uh, was the recruitment of a dermatovenereologist, uh, Dr. Canopius, who was based in Batavia. And he spent four months among the Marind. Uh, Canopius had worked in Suriname. He'd seen the disease there. And he, fortunately, he, was, he was, knew all about the Brazilian study. He came to Meraki with Tartrametic and tried it out on a series of patients with excellent results. So this important preliminary work paved the way for Dr. Tierfelder and his wife Marie, who was also a doctor, to conduct the main treatment campaign. And here um, we see the temporary hospital that was built in Okaba and Tierfelder arrived um, fresh from Africa, uh, where he'd been working um, throughout World War I um, with General von Lettoff Forbeck, who is famous for having conducted protracted, undefeated guerrilla warfare. Um, Tierfeld was there putting up field hospitals as they went along. Um, and this experience probably stood him in good stead when he came to New Guinea. So his plan was to conduct comprehensive case finding surveys, to put up temporary hospitals in the, in the most suitable hotspots 
and uh, this photograph uh, in the foreground you actually can see Vertenten on the right and standing further back um, is Tierfelder uh, with his breeches and his pipe. Tierfelder got underway in December 1922 with a 16-day tour to, towards the international border. Uh, he had an escort of 20 police he collected 90 severely ill patients to take back to Moralfi for treatment, some of them in litters. Apparently the stench from the ulcers was enough to make him vomit, according to one witness. I recently discovered that Tierfelder in the 1930s was to be found lecturing the Nazi Association of Batavia on the semito hermetic features of the Marind, um, comparing their stature to the African Maasai and arguing that they were ethnically superior to other Papuans. This photograph actually has, it shows the interior of the hospital uh, shown on uh, the previous slide. On the left we have a couple of Indonesian nurses preparing a patient for an intravenous injection and then there's a squatting convict who's proffering a syringe. Dr. Tierfelder stands to the right with a pipe in his mouth. Some of these nurses were ex bird of paradise hunters who'd been thrown out of work by the first international ban on hunting and they were then trained by Marie Tierfelder who did most of the training of nurses uh, while her husband was away doing the, the tours of inspection. Um, so the treatment of Donovos is not, not easy. It required intravenous injection on alternate days for an average of 52 days. And on the intervening days, the wounds were dressed by the nurses. The treatment was pretty coercive initially, but later patients started to seek out treatment and families brought back members who'd absconded from, from hospital. To leave hospital, a certificate, a certificate of cure was uh, expected. And here we have the outcome of the intervention as reported by Max Tierfelder. Um, it shows an impressive drop in prevalence between the two, surve two surveys uh, two years apart. So the blue columns are the first survey and the, and the red ones the, the follow-up survey. And uh, the five pairs of bars record stretches of coastline between the main rivers. So we can attribute this dramatic uh, improvement to a number of factors. Firstly, we have a, a treatment that's reducing the duration of individual infections. We have the, the model village program, which is creating social distance between infected and uninfected families. Um, most important of all is a ban on all events associated with the semen rituals. Uh, which I think has to, had to be the most important factor that had been amplifying transmission. Uh, so the control of donovanosis was accompanied by a restoration of fertility, but population growth took much longer to recover, uh, partly because of um, later waves of influenza in the 1930s. Um, I think the later flare-ups of donovanosis um, could, could be due to, partly to drug resistance, um, certainly th there was a belief that the forbidden rituals were taking place in remoter areas in, in later years. The Mariners certainly didn't find it easy to adjust to their forced resettlement in fewer, larger villages, and attempts to steer them towards a cash economy uh, rarely did well. Foreign traders, mostly Chinese and Indonesian, were allowed to dominate the local economy, and the post-war efforts by the Dutch to invest in development um, largely uh, passed the Marind by. So many lingering questions remain over this episode. Do we celebrate it as a medical triumph in testing circumstances in the pre-antibiotic era? Uh, an intervention which restored fertility and eventually population growth? Or do we see it primarily as a bit of medical colonialism, which allowed the Dutch to flaunt their ethical credentials and advanced science, but forced the Marriott into a radical change of lifestyle, giving precious little help for them to adjust to a, a fast changing world that surrounded them 
this monument tellingly uh, this is the monument in Okaba has no text in the Marian language and it appears to feed into a myth that glorifies the European actors in this story without properly acknowledging how little it served the long-term future of the Marians. I've not been able to discover who paid for this expensive monument, which is to be found planted among a population that is now malnourished and impoverished. In conclusion, I would say that this episode teaches us many things about the ways in which epidemics unfold and are dealt with. Um, there's an abundance of different narratives and perspectives one can choose to focus on depending on your, your own area of interest, if that be culture or history or language, anthropology, or in my own case, sexually transmitted infections. So thank you very much uh, for, for listening.